Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Optimal Health Show. In this week's podcast, I got the one and only Dr. Johnny Bowden to drop by. You may know him as the Rogue Nutritionist. Now, Dr. Johnny Bowden has his PhD. He's also a clinical nutritionist. He is nationally known in the field of weight loss, nutrition, and health. And he has written many successful bestsellers books and his recent book, The Cholesterol Myth. Now, in today's podcast, we're going to be talking about everything cholesterol. I mean, the whole shebang. Is cholesterol really dangerous for us? The different forms of cholesterol? What types of testing you should do for cholesterol? And everything you need to know about your body in relationship to cholesterol. So, please sit back, relax, enjoy the show. But, before we actually get into today's episode, I just want to make sure if you had the opportunity to head over to helpmesleepsolution.com this is where I'm offering my free seven week sleep course where I'll personally guide you step by step in optimizing your sleep through proper nutrition supplementation and specialization now on with the show and welcome guys to another episode of the optimal health show we got a fantastic guest for you today we got the one and the only dr. Johnny Bowden how you doing brother Hey man, how are you? Good to talk to you. Likewise, likewise. I'm doing good. It's a great day over here. And uh, what's new in the world of Dr. Johnny Bowden? Well, I'm on my way to Washington. As soon as I get off with you, I'll be in Washington speaking at the Vitamin Shop Conference. And uh, then coming back here and working on our Unleash Your Thin Diet program, which is just doing great, I'm happy to say, and doing different talks about the Great Cholesterol Myth book. We just, I was just filmed for a documentary in Australia by the BBC that's covering the great cholesterol controversy. And I'll tell you, Amir, that's an interesting story in and of itself, the kind of pressure that this reporter, this PhD holding reporter, science journalist, was getting from the establishment about even airing our controversial ideas about cholesterol, cholesterol testing, and statin drugs. Uh, the pressure uh, is, is just enormous for them to not uh, really let us uh, get our side of the story out there, but we're getting it out there. Uh, the Australian BBC did the documentary. Uh, you know, as you know, we run the Dr. Oz show, we run the doctors. So people are paying attention, and the book is still number one in heart disease in on Amazon, which makes me very, very happy. It's beating out all the low fat books, that's for sure. So um, things are really wonderful in my world. I hope they are in yours, and I'm excited to be on the show. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, the, your book is fantastic. I consider it one of the best books on cholesterol out there. It will be in the show notes, guys. So please do yourself a favor. If you want to learn about cholesterol, go get that book. Now, this brings me to a question is, you know, obviously you've been studying your whole life about nutrition. What sparked your interest in cholesterol? Well, it's, it's interesting and a very logical uh, uh, path, actually. I started my career in health and fitness in 1990 as a personal trainer and I had you know a million certifications in personal training we learned all the we, personal trainers learn most of or at least at that time and I think it's still going on now learn most of their nutrition information from kind of American Dietetic Association approved courses all the very very standard outdated you know middle of the road past its expiration date kind of uh, stuff, you know, high carb diets, you need carbs for energy, saturated fat is bad, and uh, you know, low fat diet is the most protective, all that hogwash. So we learned all that as personal trainers. And my first, uh, my first inkling that what we had learned was not the whole truth about nutrition came in the early 90s when some of my clients who were not losing weight who were doing everything they were told. And I know a lot of people think, oh, yeah, if they're, they're probably lying about how much food they eat or they're lying about their exercising. By and large, it's not really always true. They're very, very motivated people who are very heavy and they're doing everything we're telling them to do. We're telling them the wrong things. And what we started to notice as trainers were that were people were beginning to just get so frustrated with the low-fat diet that they were giving Atkins a chance. Now, you have to understand where I came from at the time, my training very conservative, very middle of the road, very establishment. I, like everybody else, thought that Atkins was Satan. I thought that if you went on the Atkins diet, you were a heart attack waiting to happen. I thought that, oh, maybe, maybe, maybe you might, you know, lose so a few pounds of water weight. That was the usual, you know, wrap on the high protein diets. You just lose water weight. So maybe you'll lose a little water weight, maybe even lose a couple pounds. 
cholesterol. So, uh, you know, against our wishes, a number of clients, certainly in my own uh, practice, uh, did go on Atkins, and lo and behold, uh, I was shocked to see that the uh, you know they didn't get heart attacks, they didn't die, the world didn't end. Uh, it wasn't the apocalypse now. In fact, not only did they lose weight, but they would come back with improved blood lipid levels, lower triglycerides, so they, lower blood pressure, um, higher HDL cholesterol in some cases. And this was astonishing because it defied everything we had been taught about how the human body runs and what kinds of fuel we need and what's healthy and so forth. So this was the beginning of my kind of crack in the armor of what I had been taught. And uh, it continued over the next 10 years. I was very lucky to have uh, chance encounters with people like Barry Sears, who spent hours with me kind of turning my head around and making me so interested in this that I went back to school for nutrition. And that's when I got my, my certifications and degrees. Um, you know, starting again as a personal trainer. Uh, and, you know, hearing all of this and going to conferences and reading this stuff, I began to realize fairly quickly that we had been sold a bill of goods about diet. Now, here's how it kind of connects to cholesterol. When you think about it, the only reason you have ever been warned off saturated fat is why? Because it raises cholesterol. That's the only reason anyone has ever told anybody in the United States of America to not eat saturated fat and to not eat so much protein, not eat so much fat. The saturated fat became all fat. Then we went on low fat diets. The only reason, let me repeat that, <laughs> the only reason you've ever been told that is because of cholesterol. And why are we worried about cholesterol? Well, because we believe that high cholesterol leads to heart attacks. And, heart, and cholesterol is a big marker for heart disease. Now, here's my question to you and to the audience. If that turns out to be untrue, if the cholesterol hypothesis turns out to be a myth, what does that do to the dietary recommendations of the past 40 years? It crumbles See, down. It crumbles like a slice of white bread. That's right. But seriously, it collapses like a house of cards because it's all based on the fear of cholesterol and, and on the belief that cholesterol leads to heart attacks. So this is where I began to kind of butt heads with my client's doctors because here they are, they're coming back. None of these bad things are happening. Their blood lipids are improved and their doctors are telling you cannot do this. You got to remember at that time, they, they didn't even believe in fish oil. I mean, they were just... You know, doctors are the last to know about any of this stuff, except for the, you know, let, let, me, let me apologize to the same 300 doctors that I see at every nutritional medicine conference in America, but there's about 100,000 doctors, and I mean, it's more than 100,000 doctors in America, and um, it's the same couple hundred that you see. Most of them do not educate themselves in nutrition. They mm -hmm. certainly don't get it in medical school. So we would butt heads, me as a nutritionist and a trainer, the advice I was giving my clients would often butt heads with the with the kind of really out of date uh, crapola that a lot of doctors were just regurgitating because they heard it on CNN and heard it from the American Dietetic Association and they got that information just like everybody else. High carb diets are good for you. Low fat diets are good for you. They didn't really explain the biochemistry or look at it that much. They're doctors. They have limited time. They're doing their specialty. They have seven minutes to see you. Guess what? They don't read about nutrition. So they believe like everybody else. Low fat diets, high fat diets cause heart disease. So we would find ourselves butting heads against this medical establishment all the time and still do. So my quest to find out what the real deal on this was, why, you know, why was the literature all over the place on saturated fat cholesterol? Why were we treating this high cholesterol epidemic with these drugs that appear to have quite a number of side effects, uh, which I saw not only in my clients, but then began to read about and study. And so it became kind of a, a natural outgrowth uh, to talk about cholesterol coming from where I was coming from, the weight loss field, you know, and wanting to keep people's hearts healthy and wanting to be able to exercise and finding out that what we had been taught to fear, namely cholesterol, was kind of a myth. Cholesterol is a vitally important molecule. You need it for thinking. You need it for the brain. You need it to fight infections. You need it to make gall uh, to make bile acids. I mean, if you make your sex hormones from cholesterol, what are we chasing here? And really... Uh, what are we getting for our chase? Exactly. And then through your discoveries and everything, let's just educate our audience for now and please explain to them that what they actually think of cholesterol today 
is not the truth, right? So if you want to well, tell them, it's, it's a truth. yes, yes, you're absolutely right, Amir. You see, what, what's happened is, you know, as as time goes on in any field, think about the fields that you guys are in, you audience members. Every year we learn more, right? Every year we have more detail. You know, and when, when I when computers first came out, they weighed ten tons, and you could barely get one. Of, you know, <laughs> yeah, so things yeah. get we get more. All right, now with cholesterol. When people first became aware of cholesterol in the, like the 60s, you basically got a cholesterol test. You got one number. Mm. They, you know, you go to a health fair and they'd say, they prick your finger and take a little thing of blood and they say, oh, your cholesterol is 230. Oh, it's 190. You got one number. Now, we've known for a long, long time about the fact that cholesterol travels in the body in various packages called lipoprotein. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't until the late 60s or so that doctors started saying, you know, these really, they started paying attention to that and they started noticing that the cholesterol that is packaged in one kind of lipoprotein has one kind of activity and the kind that's packaged in another kind called LDL has a different kind of activity. And they looked at the, it's the same cholesterol, by the way, it's packaged in different containers. One is called a low density lipoprotein, one's called a high density lipoprotein. And because these, uh, these two lipoproteins had somewhat different functions in the body. They began using the shorthand of good cholesterol for HDL and bad cholesterol for LDL. Mm. Now, this was a big improvement on one number, but it's out of date. We now know that there's at least five kinds of HDL and five kinds of LDL, and they behave, and they behave differently. And there's, you know, uh, most HDL is pretty good stuff, but there's one that's inflammatory. And LDL has two particularly important flavors, two sizes, two types of particles that we need to pay attention to. One is called LDL-A, and one is called LDL-B. And the Bs are the bad guys. And the As, not so much. They're kind of harmless. So now we have to look under the, the lid a little bit and say, well, when cholesterol goes up, it, what, is it the good bad cholesterol or the bad bad cholesterol? So now we have more information. We have more ways of looking at cholesterol. We look, for example, at the number of particles, which is hugely important. But these things are available in the newer tests, and doctors are still using those old-fashioned, out-of-date good and bad cholesterol tests. So what we're measuring is not the whole story by a long shot. So what should people be measuring today when they go to their doctors for a cholesterol checkup? Well, there's a number of tests that are, are proving to be a, a lot better than the, than the basic HDL, LDL one. One is the number, it, it's, uh, they, they call it a particle test, and it'll tell you whether you have mostly LDL-A, they call it pattern A, which is way, way better or pattern B, the bad guy, in which most of your particles are those nasty little atherogenic particles. They will also tell you the number of particles because that seems to be a very good predictor for heart disease. Um, there's a test you can, there's, there's others. There's, there's a lipoprotein little a, which is a particularly nasty kind of cholesterol that they don't really pay a lot of, the drug companies don't pay a lot of attention to it because they haven't found a drug that really changes it very much. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the uh, niacin uh, appears to have a little bit of an effect on that. Niacin also has a good effect on HDL. Um, <clears throat> but we have, you can measure apple, uh, apple protein B. That's, that seems to a, a test, an up-and-coming test that has a lot of predictive value. But mainly what you're looking for are these uh, particle tests because they are much more telling than the one we've been using. So what's your then take on the whole thing with then triglycerides? How do triglycerides tie into with the HDL and the LDL? Excellent question. I have a feeling you're leading me right to the answer I wanted to give you. There's an excellent test you can do at home yourself. Low tech costs nothing. Here's what you do. You're going to look at your last blood test. <clears throat> Hopefully it's a recent one. If it's too far in the past, don't go by that because it's telling you it's, you know, it's a digital snapshot of something that happens. You want it to be fairly recent in order to get any good information from it. But here's the information you're looking for. You go on the blood test and you look at triglycerides. That's the thing you just mentioned. It's on every complete blood count. Every basic blood test in the world does your triglycerides. That's something to pay attention to. You want those lower. You, the, the labs will say 150 or under. I like 100 or under, but you want them low. Lower than 150 for sure. Optimal health, my opinion, lower than 100. Mm -hmm. But here's what you're gonna do. Here's the test. You take that number, then you look at your HDL cholesterol, high density lipoprotein, HDL cholesterol, only, and you do a ratio, triglycerides divided by HDL. That gives you the ratio. So, example, triglycerides are 100, 
HDL is 50, your ratio is 2, 100 divided by 50. In some incredibly healthy cases, your triglycerides may even be lower than your HDL. You may have a negative ratio, you may have an under one. But if it's 100 to 50, that's a ratio of 2. If it's 300 triglycerides and say 30 HDL, that's 300 divided by 30, that's a ratio of 10. You want that ratio low. Two or under is ideal. Two or under has a very, very low risk of heart disease. And two or under predicts heart disease about 16 times better. And when, when people have a low ratio like that or a high ratio, it's a 16 times better predictor than just about anything else. So it seems though the triglycerides are really something more to be concerned about than your HDL at the moment. So what's the whole take with triglycerides? What's happening there? I think triglycerides are a very important measure. Uh, you know, the higher the tri, even if your H, look, I, I have had a lot of trouble changing my HDL. I exercise, I do all the right things. It stays around 40. That's not ideal, but it's been stuck there for 20 years. Okay, so you may not be able to do much about your HDL, but you can totally change your triglycerides. So even if you're, look, take my case, I have a 40 HDL. If I had a 400 triglycerides, my ratio is 10. It's really bad. I'm mm -hmm. a walking. But since I can do something about the triglycerides, even if I don't touch the HDL, if I bring my triglycerides down to 80, now my ratio is the same 40 HDL. Now it's 80 divided by 40. Now my ratio is 2. So but with dietary and lifestyle interventions, you can drop your triglycerides like a rock. You can't, it's, in my experience, it's a lot harder to do anything about your HDL. <laughs> but you know, you're so, about a ratio. so what do you say, though, like a low glycemic or like a ancestral slash paleo-ish type of diet would be really beneficial for somebody looking to lower the triglycerides? That is exactly what I, you took the words right out of my mouth. That's precisely right. That's why they pay you the big bucks, right? That's what we're both getting. Yeah. yeah. Triglycerides <laughs> <laughs> drop like a rock on a low carb diet. It's that simple. Ninety nine percent of the time, they will drop like a rock, like a big fat boulder in the ocean. Um, and that's because the liver makes triglycerides out of sugar. Yeah. The more carbs you eat, the more it's frantically packaging those things into some kind of compound to get them the heck out of there. And triglycerides are, are, is what you know, fructose particularly raises triglycerides more than any other sugar. So <clears throat> uh, absolutely, when you cut back on starches and sugars, uh, you will automatically see a drop in triglycerides almost all the time. Fantastic. So what's this whole scare then when like the whole establishment scaring people saying you eat fat, it's going to you know, raise your cholesterol. Where, where did this whole crazy ideology of fat causing cholesterol? Can you just explain to our audience that you know, healthy fat. So there is a difference between, say, like uh, vegetable oils and canola oils compared to, you know, healthy saturated fats they get from grass fed beef, beef. So can you explain to our audience, like, healthy fat does not cause your cholesterol to become, uh, for example, uh, your, the dense particles? Well, now, you, that's now there is the step that people skip. And this is why this new information about particles is so important. Saturated fat very often does raise LDL cholesterol. But if you now look under the hood with the new information we have, it changes the population. Mm -hmm. It raises the number of big fluffy A particles and lowers the number of B. So even though the LDL overall might go up, if you had, say, 99, let's just make up a number. Let's say you had uh, 50 nasty little B particles and uh, 50 little A particles. And so you're uh, 50 big A particles. So your LDL is 100. And now um, you, t you eat a lot of saturated fat and um, your LDL goes up to 130. But now let's say 100 of those are the big fluffy particles and only 30 of them are the bad ones. Well, your LDL went up overall, but you're, you just got healthier. <laughs> and your blood lipid profile actually got better in terms of predicting heart disease because you have now less of the small inflammatory particles and more of the big fluffy. That's true. And I think the people right now, they're kind of scared and really th uh, more more like a huge fear going on with them because for their whole life, they've been primed and educated saying, you know, cholesterol's bad, cholesterol's evil. And you just mentioned to us that, no, it's not. You need it for your hormones, sex hormones. You need it for absolutely everything in your body. So this whole ideology of, uh-oh, I got all of a sudden a little bit elevated LDL is may in fact be healthier for you. But if it's the right particle size. Right, right. So, I mean, I think that the, the main thing, we've been portrayed as kind of extremists and, you know, and, and I, I think the truth is this, uh, 
We're not saying that cholesterol plays no part in heart disease. The small, dense, oxidized particles, absolutely. Yeah. Along with, you know, calcium and bacteria and all kinds of other things that get caught in plaque. Yeah, but this whole Ooh, oxidization, the, Dr. John, don't you think this whole oxidization thing is maybe cause of, say, overconsumption of, uh, you know, high fructose corn syrup, overconsumption of unhealthy carbs, overconsumption of it's sugar? Just, Absolutely. We talk in the great cholesterol myth about sugar being one of the four major promoters of heart disease. Again, not the only one, but these are really big inflammatory foods, or if you want to call them foods, foods, sugar, and, and, and processed carbs, and grains that really do have an inflammatory effect on a big portion of the population. And we talk about why sugar really should have been the culprit all along, not that. Now, um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> pretty much that's the answer. <laughs> Definitely. So people really need to understand that you know, I think the best way, because like you mentioned earlier, you're going to all these conferences around and you're only seeing about 300 doctors and there's about 100, another 100,000 doctors in the United States. So I think everybody who has a family practitioner should really then educate their doctor and show them that there is brand new modern day evidence that it's kind of hard to refute, right? Oh, I think, I think the evidence is, look, the thing about evidence and why it's so confusing for the general public is that there's lots of facts and figures and they can be interpreted in lots of different ways and a lot of people have a vested interest in how they get interpreted. They're not lying, they're just choosing which facts and figures to, uh, to emphasize, in, you know what I mean? Just like a marketing company would do and say, all right, what are we going to talk about? These are, the, these are the selling points, let's get these out here. I'll give you an example with statin drugs and a number of studies with statin drugs you might see a couple of less deaths in the statin-treated group from heart disease. And the statin companies that publish these studies will emphasize X percentage lower, uh, lower risk of heart disease. They might not, or they might bury in the data the fact that an equal number of people in that same group died from cancer or diabetes. Mm -hmm. So what, and, and therefore evening out any mortality advantage. So I don't know, would you rather die of cancer or a heart attack? I don't know that it's such a great <laughs> savings. If you're saving a couple of people from one disease, but you're increasing the number who die from another disease. Now I'm not saying that's true in every study, but I'm saying that's an example of how you could kind of choose what facts you want to publicize depending on what position you want, you know, to sell or you want people to believe. And I think there's a lot of that kind of stuff in the, drug industry and a lot of uh, on our side of the fence with nutrition with people who support paleo diets versus people who support low fat diets versus the raw food people versus the vegan people they all have you know lots of facts and lots of data and really what it comes down to is how do you string this data together to make a plausible narrative that people can believe and unfortunately much like you see in the US Congress uh, it gets hard because it, it, people get very frozen in their positions and they have their data and they don't want to see your data and you know and uh, it, it's just kind of the nature of the way we do things you know it's human nature it's confirmation bias it's listening to the radio station that has your political views and kind of not listening to the other one and we do the same thing there's a term in psychology for it. it's called confirmation bias you tend to look for the evidence for the things you or to confirm what you already believe so yeah we got a long road to ahead to try to turn around this cholesterol madness train but there's a lot at stake because in my view and in, our, in, in the view of our book all this attention and money and time and effort we've we've spent on chasing cholesterol has been time and effort and money taken away from having our eye on the ball of what we can really do something about. Lowering our stress, eating more antioxidants, eating more anti-inflammatory foods, getting the right kind of exercise, lowering toxic relationships in our lives. All these things have... Now, am I saying it's going to wipe out heart disease? No one thing does. Seatbelts don't wipe out traffic accidents, but man, they increase your risk. And they, they increase your odds of surviving <laughs> anything. Yeah, de definitely. I couldn't agree anymore. That's 100%. You hit the nail in the coffin. But going back to something you just touched base on, you mentioned that data. And, you know, recently there's been some kind of shocking, I would say, data come out talking about uh, fish oil. So if you can, like, enlighten our audience saying the, the whole fish oil thing going on right now and how does fish oil tie into the cholesterol? Well, uh, fish oil is definitely one of the – you know, we talk in the book The Great Cholesterol Myth about – you know, half a dozen, seven or eight supplements 
that we really recommend as just good sense, heart healthy nutrients that really do a number of different things, you know, relaxing the arteries like magnesium does or providing energy for the heart like coenzyme Q10 does or citrus bergamot, which lowers triglycerides and blood sugar and, and, and raises HDL cholesterol a little bit. So there's a lot of really good supplements we talk about, but one of the ones we talk about uh, first and with, with you know probably the most passion is omega-3 fish oils. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they're so anti-inflammatory. They're just one of the most anti-inflammatory molecules in the world. We believe inflammation is one of the major causes of disease. So here's a, yeah, there's a perfect fit. You've got a, one of the major causes or promoters of disease, and you've got something that helps put that fire out. This is a great supplement. There's thousands of studies. I mean, this stuff has been studied in you know, three, four decades. Over, you know, over well over a thousand studies confirming, you know, what fish oil can do for the body on, on a number of different biochemical ways and pathways. Um, you know, with depression, with hair and nails. I mean, with everything that 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 uh, get benefits from having these omega threes in the cell membrane and in the tissues and, and everywhere else, it does good. Now, recently, what happened was there was a um, a study that was published in the Journal of Epidemiology, and the media portrayed it as fish oil supplements cause prost prostate cancer. And you could, you know, I don't know when people listen to your uh, broadcast. It, it, uh, hopefully, it's within a month of when this happened. Oh, but two it, weeks. It, two, two weeks uh, is going to be, yeah. Saying even a year from now because you want to hear the best of a mirror and you're going through all those. <laughs> this is something that happened in the summer of 2013. And it was a big study. And if you uh, even probably Google fish oil causes prostate cancer, you'll get a million different headlines. Fox News had a headline like that. So here's the thing. Number one, fish oil supplements were not used in that study. It was one of the most horribly reported. The media should just be spanked for this. There were no fish oil supplements in this study. The study did not show what it was reported to have shown. Uh, there, there were so many holes in this study, you could drive a Mack truck through it. I did a piece on the Huffington Post. I'm sure it'll still be up because they keep the archives up forever on fish oil causing, I called it media madness. Fish oil causes prostate cancer? Uh, I, just trust me, without going through the particulars of the study, what they looked at, what they didn't look at, there were no supplements used in the study. It was a, a, a data analysis on a, on a group uh, of participants in, a, in another study that looked at vitamin E. Uh, they didn't control for a dozen variables that were very important. They didn't look at all the fatty acids. They definitely had an agenda. And, and, and even though they did not use fish oil supplements in the um, in the study, uh, the, the lead author had no uh, qualms about saying to the press, I guess we've shown once again that nutritional supplements are dangerous. So this was a biased, stupid study, clearly meant to show something bad about DHA, which is that's what they looked at. But that's, that's crazy. I wonder who, who do you, did you find out who published this? Like, oh, sorry, who, uh, who was a sponsor behind the study? Uh, no, I, I don't. I don't know that. But I mean, you know, look. The thing is, the point is, the study didn't show that fish oil causes prostate cancer. On the contrary, other studies have shown the opposite: that it has a positive effect on on survival, on severity of cancer, on occurrence of cancer. And in any case, I don't think fish oil that that that's where fish oil really signs anyway. It's not a, It's not something that gets rid of of uh, that that. Uh, prevents cancer. It's something that lowers inflammation and helps with the brain and helps with the heart and helps with vision and helps with skin and nails. But, you know, we can't expect one supplement to, you know, it, it doesn't save your marriage either. That doesn't mean it's not useful, you know, as a supplement. It's oh, just not. That, that, that would be a trillion dollar supplement right there if it saved your marriage. <laughs> right. 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 Now, now, we do have to uh, stress out that not all fish oils are created equally, right? Uh, absolutely. Uh, there's a huge difference. I mean, um, for example, look, things are only as good as their source. If mm -hmm. you, you know, if you get your fish from the bottom of the Hudson River in New York City, you know, <laughs> that's where you, it's probably not going to be great. Yeah, yeah. So, I'm very big believer in in uh, getting a pro all vitamins and minerals, but certainly fish oil from very from good companies with great reputations that make stuff in small batches. They don't ship it overseas and keep it on the bottom shelf of the drugstore for a year where look fish oil goes rancid it, mm -hmm. you know it can go rancid just like anything in your and, and you can just bite into the capsule and if you smell it or if it tastes funny dude it's rancid i mean that's you know that's not going to do you much good in your body so you really want to get it from companies i like barleans very much i'm a big fan of barleans they can be gotten in any you know they're in the vitamin shop they're 
they're, they're all over. They're reasonably priced. It's a great company. But you know, any company you really believe in that that does assays and checks for impurities and things like that, you're going to be fine with. Fantastic. And what's your take though? Like, okay, apart side from fish oil, would you say fish oil is different than from cod liver oil? Because there's a huge like uh, kind of debate: fish. what's better, fish oil versus cod liver oil? So, what's your I, personal I, take? You know, on? Short of it is that I don't recommend cod liver oil for adults. It's fine for children. It's got some really good research on it behind it for children. The vitamin A and D ratio isn't great for adults. It seems to be fine for children, especially when they're having you know flus and colds and things like that. Um, but for adults, I think straight fish oil is a better choice and take your vitamin D separately. Fantastic. That's amazing. So, you know, let's touch base quickly on this last thing. You just mentioned vitamin D. Obviously, there's a connection between vitamin D and cholesterol, right? Between vitamin D and cholesterol? Yes. Well, cholesterol is the parent molecule for vitamin D. There you go. So, so pe people need to then know the sheer importance uh, the sheer importance that vitamin D has towards their health in conjunction to having healthy levels of cholesterol. I think that's true, and now I'll give you something that has no scientific validity. It's my personal hypothesis. I think it's worth something worth thinking about. Um, we know that cholesterol is the parent molecule for our sex hormones. Mm -hmm. We know that there is that we have that there's been a huge movement, very much funded and marketed by the pharmaceutical companies, and, and with the willingness of all the major medical organizations to treat high cholesterol. And the way we treat it is with statin drugs. They are an enormously uh, lucrative and popular drug. I think Lipitor was, is, may just have lost its title as the greatest selling drug of all time, producing the most money, the $30 billion a year for the drug companies in, um, in statin drugs. I think it's worth wondering whether the reason we have an epidemic of erectile dysfunction among middle-aged men is that we are putting them, there may be more than a coincidence that we're putting them all on statin drugs. Sexual uh, loss of libido, loss of sex drive is one of the primary side effects of statin drugs. When, when you talk to people who actually have those side effects, and they're very underreported, but they exist, and that's one of the more common ones, loss of libido. I'm not saying that's the only cause, but it's more than a coincidence, and we also have a tremendous vitamin D deficiency. So, you know, is that at all related to the fact that we are lowering cholesterol aggressively in the entire population? I don't know. Maybe not, but it seems to me something worth thinking about. I don't know. I stand on your hypothesis right there because I'm going to come from a young man's perspective. I'm, I'm 28 years young. And just looking at my mm -hmm. generation over here, most people my age, I won't lie, John. I'm going to tell you straight out. They're, they're weak. They're, they're not how nature intended men to be per se they can hardly do a push-up they can't even pull themselves up they can't even walk by the time they're 30 they're having freaking back problems does that sound normal <laughs> you know what i mean like come on are you, are, you, are you like give me a break yet there were like cultures like the hunzas from like um the hindu kush mountains of afghanistan that these men were like 80 years old and stronger than the men over here who are in their 40s well, I, I think it's a good place to end because I'll tell you that, in, in, you know, I wrote a book a few years ago called The Most Effective Ways to Live Longer. Mm -hmm. And I, my next birthday, I'll be 67. Amazing. And I can tell you that I have, the, I have more energy. I wake up without an alarm clock. I take no medications uh, except one I put myself on. Through, I asked my doctor for it, and it's metformin and not for blood sugar, but because it actually reduces the risk of pancreatic cancer. Mm -hmm. um, but I take no prescription medications. Um, all my blood levels are great. Uh, I have a fabulous, passionate relationship with my much-loved uh, partner, my, my wife. Uh, I, I work all the time. I, have, I play tennis two hours a day. So I know a little bit about healthy aging. And I, <laughs> to, uh, at least for myself, but I want to also know what other people have found. So there's a lot of research on healthy aging. There's a lot of research on the areas in the, on the globe in which there are the most healthy centenarians. These are people who live to the age of 100, but not just manage on assisted, in assisted living or on an oxygen tent, but actually, you know, like you just mentioned, 94 years old, they're marching goats up the hills of Sardinia and they're gardening in the fields in Okinawa, you know, really healthy. Yeah. And uh, they looked at these areas, they're called the Blue Zones. There's about, uh, there were four of them when the book The Blue Zones was written, there are now identified at least five. And they looked at what these folks had in common, and here's the thing, I mean, you know, they didn't all eat the same food. Some, only one of them, uh, one of these uh, societies or, or areas was really vegetarian, Loma Linda, uh, California, that's because most of them are Seventh-day Adventists there. Um, so they ate a variety of foods, they, they had a lot of different things going on in their lives, both the 
the processed foods. Yeah. So the, the one, there were two real things that kind of connected all these societies where they lived healthily. They didn't eat processed foods, and they had hugely important personal connections. Yeah, they had family they, connections, and one other thing. Absolutely. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and I was going to say one other thing they had really in common that I talk about this, and I also mentioned the Blue Zones in my uh, workshops that I do, is they all followed a healthy sleeping cycle. That, well, sure. I mean, I think that that's an outgrowth of, you know, of the lifestyle. Definitely. You know? So um, if, you, if you had to summarize then one thing, what would you tell anybody that, w that would be your number one optimal health tip? Like if they had to do one absolute thing to change their life, what would that one thing be? Relax. Awesome. I, I think that the, I think, you know, you, it's almost impossible what like one food to eat or one meditation to do. I think that probably the impact of stress and worry and anxiety on our health has been hugely underappreciated, except in professional communities where they already know this stuff. But in the general public, I don't think people realize the degree to which stress ages us, puts fat on our middles, which, which contributes to risk for all kinds of other metabolic diseases. Um, stress shrinks an area of the brain called the hippocampus. Uh, you know, all of these things age us, they worry us, they, they, they diminish the quality of our lives, they diminish our well-being. Um, and so if there was one thing that I could tell people to do is take a deep breath and, you know, like waiting for it to exhale, exhale. You know, <laughs> you know, make a gratitude list, look around, find something to be loving or grateful about and do something to contribute to something other than yourself, whether it be an animal or a plant or a mm. person or a charity. Because these things really do have, they, they, without getting too airy-fairy, these soul things really do benefit. There's no mind-body dichotomy anymore. It doesn't exist. There's not a single smart scientist who believes that. Yeah. So we know that these things all talk to each other. The cells communicate. The gut communicates with the brain. The brain communicates with the immune system. The immune system communicates with, the, you know, with all the mechanisms. Everything talks to everything else. So when you have... When you relax and you celebrate and you have some joy in your life and you, you know, just whatever it takes for you, that's probably the biggest all over benefit you could poss possibly give yourself. That drink a lot of water and move around a lot. I mean, if you want three, there's three tips for you right there. Awesome. I couldn't agree more. Those are amazing tips. Start about your cockamamie cholesterol and start worrying, you know, about good <laughs> things you can do about your life and your heart. <laughs> That's right. I want to thank you so much, Dr. Johnny Bowden, for coming on the show and educating Great. us and our audience about, you know, the real it's truth so behind cool. cholesterol. So everybody, you heard, you heard it. Dr. Johnny Bowden's tip is just relax, take it easy, and everything else will just be fine. Take care. Take Bye -bye. care, guys. Bye. Hey guys, I really hope you enjoyed today's episode with Dr. Johnny Bowden. There's many things now you know about cholesterol and what you can do to benefit yourself. So don't just get stuck in that paradigm thinking that cholesterol is evil for you. Obviously, you know you now know that cholesterol is needed for all your hormones and that the whole HDL, LDL type of thing is complete rubbish. Now this episode would not be possible if it wasn't for your contribution and your help. Now if you haven't already, head over to amirrosic.com and join the Optimal Tribe. By becoming an Inner Tribes member, you're going to receive exclusive content that I bring out every single week and receive exclusive episodes that I do with world-class experts. Now, until next time, my friends, have an amazing week.